Hi guys, Dr. Jillard. This is your week five Tuesday spinal anatomy lecture. Talking about the nucleus pulposus and annulus fibrosus mostly today. And we didn't have live class today because you are studying for your wet lab final. So here it is. But this uh, posting these slides will be on Brightspace. This is just like a regular class lecture, so you will be responsible for this material. Here we go. Intervertebral disc, hopefully you know this because some of this is already on your test, but it's made up of a nucleus pulposus and an annulus fibrosus uh, in this little cartoon. Um, it's one of the three ligaments of the vertebral body. Remember, anytime I said there's three things, that's a great opportunity for a board question. Um, so what are the three, or which one of the following is not one of the three ligaments of the vertebral body. So anterior, post, anterior longitudinal ligament, posterior longitudinal ligament, and the annulus fibrosa, fibrosis. Um, some people call this the annuli fibrosis. Some people believe it is spelled with only one N, annulus fibrosis. Uh, Bogduke and Kramer both actually believe that, but the researchers spell it with two N's. So a little controversy on that. Let's talk about this nucleus pulposus, which is, of course, the center of the disc. It's held in place by very strong rings of type 1 collagen. These are called lamellae, or lamellae. Lamella is singular. Lamellae is plural. Uh, the cells of the nucleus pulposus, uh, like any cell in your body, has a job to do. And this one's main job is to make a molecule uh, called a glycosaminoglycan. And we'll talk about this in depth tomorrow, glycosaminoglycans, uh, affectionately known as GAGs. Glycosaminoglycans. GAGs will find our social creatures. They don't like to be alone. Most of them don't like to be alone, and they bind together on a stick of protein and form a molecule called a proteoglycan. These words you need to memorize, proteoglycan, glycosaminoglycan, are, are the building blocks of proteoglycans. And we'll learn that proteoglycans are the building blocks of a gigantic molecule called an agarcan, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. The nucleus pulposus, because of these cell types, uh, proteoglycans and GAGs are extremely hydrophilic. They love, they're like SpongeBob. They love to soak up water. And therefore, the nucleus pulposus is normally about 80% water. Okay, there's another nucleus pulposus. Uh, there are the lamellae rings around it from this overhead view, or this axial view. And there's the, collectively, the lamellae make up the annulus fibrosus. Well, because the nucleus pulposus is so watery, how come it doesn't squish like a stepping on a grape? Right, because you got the weight of your trunk and the weight of gravity pushing down on your disc. How come it doesn't squish all over? Because it's held in place. The nucleus pulposus is held in place by these lamellae. Um, so they're they're really important. And when axial load does push down on the disc, it tries to escape, but it can't. It's held firmly in place, and therefore it becomes a ball bearing, or like a, like a ball bearing, right? It's, water is incompressible, so it becomes rock hard, and that's actually the pivot point where most of the range of motion occurs in the lumbar spine, flexion, extension, lateral flexion, rotation. Mainly in a normal disc, they occur around the, uh, the nucleus pulposus. Now, we've already talked about this. We're going to talk about these even more, these grade 4 and grade 5 annular tears. If you rip your disc through like this, picture, see the disc is ripped. That completely screws up the biomechanics because now you've got uh, maybe 15 20% larger nucleus than normal. And many cadaver studies on this have shown that the center of gravity in someone with this full thickness annular tear, or a grade 4 or grade 5 annular tear, depending on whether it's leaking or not, 
Sometimes they leak chemicals right out. Um, it shifts the center of gravity right over the posterior annulus, which is where all those darn nerves are, right? We learned the sign of vertebral nerves live back here. Um, and that's not good. Plus, it overloads the facet joints. Here's the Z joints, right? Superior articular process, inferior articular process is here. There's the joint itself. And these get worn out. So this annular tear is kind of the root of all evil. What about embryological origin? Uh, we won't get crazy into it. I almost got crazy into this, but I said I'll save this for next quarter. Um, but just kind of the bottom line, the nucleus propulsus is made mainly of nodal, the nodal cord. Okay, I haven't, we haven't got to that in embryology, but we're headed that way. And the nodal cord usually degenerates away, but some of it stays, uh, and just a little bit of it helps form the nucleus propulsus. In fact, it's the only thing in the body that is normally formed of nodal cord. If a big piece of nodal cord doesn't degenerate away, it can cause a nasty tumor called a cordoba. Talk about cordomas later. The nucleus propulsus is completely avascular. What does that mean, avascular? No nerves, completely without nerves. Uh, or without blood vessels, right? It has no blood vessels in there. It also is non innervated So that means it has no blood vessels and no nerves. Uh, in fact, not only the nucleus pulsus, but the inner one-third of the annulus fibrosus also has no nerves as well. The outer one-third, or outer two-thirds, really the outer one-third, um, does have blood vessels and sinovertebral nerves of the aneus fibrosis. The nucleus has nothing. There's no lymph vessels anywhere in the disc. Uh, but if you're a nucleus propulsus cell, that's a pretty that's pretty tough to be a nucleus propulsus cell if there's no blood vessels. How come? Well, all cells, they're living they're living tissue. They're a living creature, your cells, they need oxygen. They need glucose. Uh, they need to have their waste removed, right? How are you going to do that if you don't have a circulatory system to do that? That's very tough, and that's why degenerative disc disease and back problems are so common in humans. Not only humans, there's dogs, and certain species of dogs have a lot of trouble as well, uh, and it's because of this, uh, this system. And why the committee designed it this way, I have no idea, but the committee should have probably made this a completely vascular structure, and we wouldn't have as much problems as we do now. So it's easy for these native nucleus propulsus cells to die off. If they die off, you lose water content, right? Because these, so these nucleus propulsus cells, their job is to secrete proteoglycans or secrete gags, uh, which grab water. So if there's not as many gags around, you're not going to have a very watery nucleus propulsus, and it gets dried out. As it gets dried out, it gets quite brittle, and it's prone to ripping. And if it rips, there's your annular tear, and that messes up biomechanics and overloads the facet joints, and all sorts of trouble happens. But once it dries out, a process called degenerative disc disease, or DDD, degenerative disc disease, begins. And that is oftentimes trouble. It doesn't always mean there's trouble. There's plenty of people with DDD, and they don't really have much back trouble. Uh, but it can for some people who are prone to, inf to inflammation, to start inflammation. Um, big trouble. There's a way to rate degenerative, degenerative disc disease. This has been around forever. Uh, this is the Furman system, like fur man, like the fur on a, your cat. Furman system has five different levels. And you can see uh, there's a beautiful normal grade one. I don't even, they probably shouldn't even call it degenerated. It's normal. But that's two, level three. Level four and five, the key with these ones are that you actually start losing the height between your discs. And of course, you know, this. these are your bones right here. Uh, that's L1. We'll say that's L2. That's the L1 disc. Um, so the really clinically important ones are if you have level 4, level 5, Furman uh, disc problem or disc 
a level four, level five Furman disc is, especially level five, um, that, that looks like my disc actually, bone, almost bone on bone. That's uh, definitely, definitely related to increased chances for low back pain. Okay, so how, now the question is, well, you told us that they don't have any blood supply, so how can these cells even be alive in the nucleus papulsis and inner? When I say nucleus papulsis, I'm basically talking about the inner third of the annulus fibrosis as well. How do these guys get blood? How do they stay alive? Well, they and how do they remove their waste? The answer is diffusion. Uh, the, diffusion. Uh, so it turns out, let's jump over here. Let's take a mid-sagittal cut right through the disc in the, in the vertebral body. Uh, you can see that the vertebral body has a tremendous blood supply. It's supplied by the vertebral uh, or the basovertebral system. And there's veins in here. I didn't draw those in. Um, and you can see how the outer portion of the disc is also has some blood in it. So the outer portion the portion is not a problem. It's the inner portion. There's no blood vessels in here. But there are blood vessels going into the the vertebral end plates here, the cartilaginous uh, as well as the bony end plate. And through diffusion, through the capillaries, I mean, this is an interstitium-like material here, so you drive uh, glucose out and nitrogen and interstitial fluid. It's driven out and it soaks into the disc and then it's also pushed out. And now the question is, well, what do you mean? How can that be? Where there's no pump in the disc? How do you suck it in and push it out? There's something called diurnal change. Ran out of room there. Diurnal change. Um, when you sleep or when you're laying supine or prone or recumbent, the disc, all the weight is off the disc, and it actually swells, and it causes a kind of a sucking force, and it encourages the diffusion of nutrients uh, out of the capillary system here in the end plate through these little marrow cavities, uh, and the disc gets fed. In the morning when you wake up, and by the way, when you wake up in the morning, are you taller in the morning or taller in the night? Or you're always the same height? You're actually taller in the morning. Why are you taller in the morning? Maybe an eighth of an inch taller. Well, you just sucked. You just filled up your disc. You sucked all these nutrients as well as blood fluid. We call it interstitial fluid. All that has been sucked into the disc. So the disc is now maybe that it's up this big in the morning. And then you go to work and you're up all day and the pressure and you got the weight of gravity pushing down and it literally squeezes the disc and now you can drive nutrients out. All the glucose and good stuff's been sucked up so that's not going to be driven out. Uh, but all the bad stuff that the cells release, um, carbon dioxide, um, lactate, lactic acid, uh, all the waste products are driven out. Uh, and you kind of unload your disc during the day. Uh, and that's really, I just jumped way ahead of my slides, but that's the disc feeding system. The blood nutrients diffuse through little holes called marrow cavities, which are located in the sub subchondral bone of the bony vertebral end plate. And yeah, everything I just said. And so that diurnal change, this is everything I just said as well. Okay, so you can read through that. There's a cartoon of those marrow cavities, marrow channels in the subchondral bone. That's kind of an AKA for bony end plate. Here's the vertebral end plate, which is a cartilaginous material with a ground substance in it. It's like an interstitium. And again, uh, at night, there's a sucking force and it drives it drives blood and it drives glucose and nitrogen and it drives everything in here. Uh, but in the day when you're compressing, it drives stuff. Or stuff is sucked back out. Uh, but there's no glucose to push out because it's all been soaked up by the cells. But there is waste that's been made overnight and that's driven out. See how that works? Okay, there's the feeding system at night. 
uh, where the, all the glucose molecules and everything is being sucked in. The inner part here doesn't need it because the same thing happens here through diffusion. What can go wrong? Well, what if you get osteoarthritis and you clog up these marrow channels, right? You'll, you're going to learn about end plate sclerosis. Some people with arthritis, we, even when you take an x-ray, the ends, the vertebral end plates will look, the bony end plates will be all white. Uh, and when you see that, you can almost guarantee when they take an MRI, that disc is going to be black uh, because you've destroyed those little marrow channels and the disc, the inner part of the disc can't be fed. And as I said, if it gets dried out, it becomes very brittle and then degenerative disc disease starts showing up. And a dry and brittle disc is quite amenable to a annular tear. An annular tear can go a step further and cause a herniation, give birth to some of the nucleus pulposus. Plus the facet joints get worn out. That's like the third or fourth time I've told you. That's his one take-home message for this class, how an annular tear uh, kind of is the root of all evil. Right? There's a side by side. There's our normal looking disc, normal annulus. And this patient's developed an annular tear. And not only did they develop an annular tear, but some of the nucleus actually herniated out the tear. And that's called a disc herniation. Right? Three types of herniations protrusions, contained herniations, and sequestrations. I'm not going to test you on that. We're getting too deep into the weeds, but. Those are the three types of disc herniations. How do you see the how do you see the disc and nucleus? Well, you can't see it on X-ray. You can only see bone, maybe a little soft tissue, uh, but you certainly can see it on an MRI, and that's what you have to order. Uh, you can see an, a disc on CT a little better than you can radiographs. Uh, but MRI is the gold standard. You will be ordering hundreds of MRIs over your career. Uh, what else did I want to say there? You can on x-ray, though. You can see if a, a grade 4 or 5 uh, Furman disc, you can see that where the disc has lost height. Uh, so you can get an idea of that. Uh, here's a kind of a normal image. Not the greatest, but this is the kind of image you'll run into. Uh, and you can see a normal, probably 30-year-old or so. Man, yeah, maybe 40. It's a little facet degeneration here. Um, but there's a nucleus pulposus, and there's the annulus fibrosus on this T2-weighted image. How do I know it's T2-weighted? Because the you can see the cerebral spinal fluid. You can see the cauda equina here, the little dots of the traversing nerve roots. And look at this guy. Here's a 43-year-old patient who comes in. He, this is true case, one of my cases a few years ago. 43-year-old man, bilateral radicular pain, which you don't see that often. That always raises kind of a red flag. Um, so neurological evaluation was done, and they had loss of sensation. They couldn't feel the little pinwheel or pinpricks or toothpicks. However, you test the skin, run your fingers over the skin of their lateral feet, couldn't feel it numb, tingly. Uh, they tapped on the Achilles reflex, and they were both barely moved. Uh, you did the patellar reflexes, and they went just fine. So signs of radiculopathy, right? We explained the difference between radicular pain and radiculopathy. Uh, you ordered an MRI, and here's the key slice. This is the axial cut right through the disc. What do you see? Well, first of all, where's the nucleus? So T2 weighted. You should be able to see the nucleus because there's the cerebral spinal fluid. It's gone. Uh, so this is a the patient has degenerative disc disease. And what does that increase the chance of? Increase the chances of a rip within the disc. And so if you look at the contour of the back of the disc here, there's a nerve root right there. There's another cluster of roots right there. But you can see we have a focal kind of outpouching right there. And when you get a focal outpouching, the whole back of the disc isn't symmetrically sticking out. It's more focal right here. That's a disc herniation. And this is called, this would be a broad-based central disc protrusion. And both traversing nerve roots 
And you need that for your test today, right? What nerve? If this is the L5 disc, what nerve roots are these? These are the traversing S1 nerve roots. At the level of L5, these nerve roots, at the level of L1, 2, 3, and 4, these traversing roots are inside the thecal sac. But at the level of L5, they are usually already outside the thecal sac. They've already butted out. So those are the traversing S1 nerve roots. And yeah, they're contacted here. So what we can't see is what caused this herniation. So probably 99% chance if we could see in here, which you can, you can do a procedure called discography where you squirt contrast in here and pressurize it. And then you put them in either fluoroscopic or better yet, a CT scan and you see what happens. And a lot of times you'll see that that contrast running right through a big annular tear. And we also see a white spot right here. See that white spot? That's called a high intensity zone. Um, and that's about 85, 90% of the cases. If you do discography, you'll find a grade five annular tear here, uh, which is maybe leaking. All right, so that's the HIZ sign. And we got a protrusion here, which is the smaller class of disc herniation. Uh, a extrusion is a bigger herniation, a sequestration is the herniation breaks right loose. All right, so there's everything we said. I forgot to mention the DDD though. You can add degenerative disc disease in there for sure. All right, hydrostatic pressure, we talked about that already, the weight of gravity. There's the nucleus and it's trying to get out, but it can't because the annulus. So therefore you have a very high pressure during the day inside your disc and which drives nutrients out. But it turns out those cells of the disc, they thrive on pressure. They love pressure. In fact, if they don't have pressure, um, they, don't, they don't work properly. And would it work properly? What does that mean? How does a disc cell work properly? Well, it does its thing. It secretes glycosaminoglycans, which kind of gather together to form proteoglycans. Turns out, research shows that decreased hydrostatic pressure from annular tears will inhibit the discs from doing anything. If they don't have that pressure, they get lazy and they sit home and watch TV and they don't go to work and make proteoglycans or make glycosaminoglycans. Uh, and so if they're not working, the disc dries out and that again increases the chances for annular tear. Right? I do like this question. You're only in the first quarter, but I mean, you might as well get this in your brains right now. What are the three types of annular tears? There's three ways the disc can tear, and they'll, they'll expand on this as you move through the program. They'll talk about this. Those are the lamellae there. Well, you can get a radial tear, which runs, starts from the nucleus usually and works its way out. In fact, there's a grade one goes a third of the way, a grade two goes uh, two thirds of the way, a grade three. Radial tear rips all the way through the disc. Then there's a concentric annular tear where the lamellae split and rip apart. You can often have a combination of a radial tear with a concentric tear, and that's what a HIZ sign usually indicates. And then you can have a stab lesion, like somebody kind of poked the disc here, uh, and that's called a rim lesion. And most of these rim lesions, with the passage of time, turn into radial annular tears. Guaranteed question on that slide. Almost guaranteed. Nucleus papulsis. Uh, it, what about some histology with this? Um, it is, well, it depends how old you are. So a youngster, five, six-year-old, they still have cells in the nucleus that are made of nodal cordal tissue. Uh, so this is weird about the human, and I'll talk about, it's probably getting over your, over the scope of this class, but there's a theory about annular tears and why some aren't painful and some are painful. It's got to do maybe with this right here. Uh, but by the age of 10, those notochordal cells are replaced by the nucleus papulsa cells you have right now. And those are chondrocytes. They look like chondrocytes, cartilage producing cells. Um, they produce three things. That's another great question, right? Anytime you see three, that's an easy pickings question for boards or for me. 
So they produce type 2 collagen fiber. They produce a ground substance, which is like a toothpaste. And then we already said they produce their main function is to produce these glycosaminoglycans. A ground substance is like the toothpaste. It's the stuff that the cells of the disc sit in. they got to sit in something. Um, it surrounds nucleus pulposus cells. It's technically the interstitium, uh, and it's in the outer the outer portion is fed by capillaries, but uh, interstitium is a medium that supports cells, and nutrients have to kind of swim or diffuse through there to serve as cells. And together, the ground substance uh, is very slippery because of the proteoglycans, which we'll talk about next time. Uh, the consistency of a toothpaste. It is about 80% water. I would do want you to know that number. And it's slippery because of the glycosaminoglycans. Annulus fibrosis. Are we starting that? I guess we are. I thought we were stopping. But annulus fibrosis has started a little bit. So annulus fibrosis, uh, it corrals the nucleus pulposus. We already know this. It's made up of usually about 15 sheets of lamellae. Okay, the lamellae themselves are made up of cords, many different cords of type 1 collagen. Uh, the lamellae, you can see them here. And notice that the lamellae, and this is a blown up cartoon because the cartilaginous end plate, by the way, here's the bony end plate. There's the cartilaginous end plate. The marrow cavities would be right here. Sometimes the bony end plate is called subchondral bone. But there's those, those little passageways which feed the disc. Uh, but notice how in the end plate, some of these lamellae actually encircle the entire nucleus, and they go right into the vertebral end plate. Not true for the very outer fibers of annulus fibrosis. They anchor into the bone themselves. Uh, those are called Sharpies fibers. I think we'll see that tomorrow. Uh, do lamella completely? Now, this is, we're going to start talking about why humans have so much trouble. Why do they have so many annular tears, especially that go into the posterior and posterior lateral parts of the disc, which is the worst place for them to go, right? We have, we learned in lab that the front of the disc isn't, it doesn't carry the sensation of pain very well. At least we don't think that at this time. Um, so they're actually thin. They're thinner, they're thicker in the front and thinner in the back. And to make matters worse, they're incomplete. Like here's a nucleus pulposus. You would think the annulus fibrosis would, or the lamellae, would just completely encircle the disc. Here's the nerve roots back here. There's the thecal sac. You'd think they would completely encircle the disc, but they don't. About 40% of them. They encircle most of the disc, but they stop like that in the posterior, especially in the posterior lateral corners. So you have these gaps, and if you do get a herniated disc, it can work its way out through these gaps, right? And, that, and plus, these are thinner. The, the lamellae are thinner in the posterior as well. Um, so that's just another, uh, another, way, another reason why posterior herniations are so common. Of these 40% that are incomplete, uh, 50% of that 40% are incomplete in the worst possible space, which is the posterior lateral portion of the disc. Remember, the central portion uh, is usually protected by the ligamentum, or the posterior longitudinal ligament gives it some support. Um, that's why most disc herniations are parasagital, or they're, they're kind of paracentrally located. Uh, but because the lamellae are are gone here, are not complete here, this makes it really easy for the disc uh, to herniate out, herniate, herniate out into these, uh, these lateral recesses here. And who cares about that? Well, remember, uh, the traversing nerve roots live right in these corners, so they can get crushed. Right? So here's an example of a lamellae. It was coming around. Here's a full lamellae. This one's going all the way around. Uh, but look at this one. It stopped. And it just ended right here. And this lamella came around and it had a split to go around it. So we have a weak spot. The disc may want to herniate right through there. Okay, and I already said they're thinner in the posterior region as well, which is not, not a good thing. 
Now the Magic 65 and then we're out of here. Uh, so from a, a P to A view, or this is kind of a semi-axial P to A type view, if we draw a line a perpendicular, drop it down from the ceiling to the floor, it's interesting, the, the type 1 collagen, which are, I said they're like little ropes within these sheets of lamellae, they all run the same direction, perfectly 65 degrees from a vertical line. So that's quite amazing. What's even more amazing is this lamellae's run a positive 65 degrees. These run the opposite, negative 65 degrees. So this gives, we can see this in other tissue in the body as well. It makes a ver for a very strong design when you have this type 1 collagen running in opposite directions to each other. Very hard to rip through here. Uh, but the problem again is that these lamellae are incomplete and they're thin in the posterior region. That's why the human is so prone to have a disc here. There's just a blow up of that. All right, we'll see you tomorrow morning and keep going with this.